in Gorakhpur University. That is the English department. I congratulate you for that. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege to be present uh, from the south, maybe the southernmost state of India, to perhaps the northernmost state of India. Now, in the times of uh, a pandemic, there have been the, the gaps have bridged a lot. So thank you very much. Let me go straight into my election. The uh, topic that we have taken today is about Shakespeare in India. Now this, uh, I, I would like to use my screen sharing so that I, I don't want people to get bored with my face. Maybe they can see something better. Uh, I hope uh, the, the, the technicians will allow me to uh, share my screen. Is it visible? My screen is visible now? Is it visible now? Yes, has been seen. Is it visible? Sir, it is visible, sir. I can't see the picture, oh. uh, sir. It's visible, it's visible, sir. Hi, yes, sir. Right. It's visible. Shakespeare in India, there's a screen. Is that visible? Yes, sir. The letters are visible, clearly visible. Okay. My minimize screen. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. I mean, the picture may not be clear. The picture may not be clear. Don't worry about that. Okay, you, can, yes, you, are, you don't see me, but you see the, the, the screen. That's more important. Okay. Yes. Uh, this is a smudged picture of Shakespeare and Kalidasa. As we know, Shakespeare, and very, very simple. I mean, uh, I know this lecture is meant for also the undergraduates. So for the Shakespeare, born 64 April, uh, as a son of John and Mary of Arden, John Shakespeare and Mary of Arden, and he was present in the Trinity Church. And then his wife is Anne Hathaway, he had three children. He was a playwright, actor, and an entrepreneur. He produced 37 plays, 154 sonnets. He died on 23rd April, 1616, and lies buried in the uh, Stratford upon Avon Church. This is his memorial that you can see here. This is his memorial bust, about which we often hear a lot. And then this is uh, the tomb of Shakespeare, where, where he lies buried in Shakespeare's. Uh, in, in this particular church. Now, what is left with us is a, a volume of 37 plays and so on. And uh, this is his first folio edition of Shakespeare. And it begins with The Tempest. And this volume contains these many texts which are divided into tragedies, comedies, and histories. 12 tragedies, 15 comedies, and then histories. And the ones presented in bold letters are the ones we are more familiar with. And as you know, The Tempest is what Shakespeare begins with. I mean, the, 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 it's the last play of Shakespeare, but ironically, it appears in the beginning of the first folio. This is the place where Shakespeare uh, lived and in, in, in most of his career. Remember, Shakespeare was also an actor. He was not just a playwright. This is the city of London. It's a Google map of the city of London and the distribution of the globe, the, the, the theater here. You can see the globe theater here. And nearby there are other theaters. I will just explain the significance of this in the next slide. This is again a modified version of the same slide. See, the first theater in England started here. That is the theater. 1576. They say it is the first theater, but now there is a controversy that there is another one called Red Lion, which came some, which comes somewhere here in this region. But anyway, as you can see, one thing it is very clear: this is a walled city of London. This is the uh, the the tower, which we often hear about. All these theaters which you see are around around the city of London, not inside the city of London. And these are the gates of the city. 
And why did they keep it away from city? Because they don't want the, the authorities of the city did not want the place and the players to corrupt to corrupt the 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 culture of the city, because they thought it was a as they put it, you know, a, a corrupt uh, practice to have a theater uh, to have theater in them. So Shakespeare first played here uh, when he started his career. First, he played at the the theater. Then the theater was dismantled and carried across across the river at the bank side, and it came up here. And this is it. And then he went over to the Blackfriars here. These are the three places where Shakespeare is known to have played. Maybe he has played somewhere else also, but these are the three places that Shakespeare is known to have staged his plays. The design of this, uh, the, the theater, the design of the theater, and the conventions of the theater affected Shakespeare. The culture of his plays affected Shakespeare. And at the time when Shakespeare was living, this was England, around the time 1500 to 1600. This was England. And then this England started when Shakespeare was alive. They registered a company on 31st December 1600. Actually, the company got a charter. And this is what what we call uh, Indians are very familiar with the East India Company. This was a symbol, original symbol of the East India Company. This is how they began. The East India Company was, uh, it, I mean, at the height of it, it had a private army about more than 200, uh, two and a half lakh, lakh soldiers, which was more, the, more than what England had at that time. Uh, did Shakespeare know anything about India? That's an interesting question. And from his plays, we find many references about India or Indian. And there are other words also, Inde, Ind, and all that. But then don't think that all these words refer to, to our India. Most probably, these refer to the, um, to the Indians of the America. But some places, they are certainly familiar. Shakespeare, we know that certainly Shakespeare was familiar with India. Uh, from Macbeth, for example. In Macbeth, we find this uh, expression in the very first act, Master of the Tiger, the, the first which speaks about this. And you know, the first Englishman to have come to India was, as far as we know, is uh, Thomas Stevens. And he published a letter dated 15, uh, uh, 1579. It was published in Hakluyt's Principal Navigations. And it describes the Portuguese in India at that time. And even he wrote some books on that, on, on Indian India. Thomas Stevens speaks about uh, the Indian culture. And he has written a book called Kustapurana in Marathi and Konkani, mixing those two languages. But more important for us is that Stevens's letter, which was published in Hakluyt's principal navigations inspired a person called Ralph Finch. Ralph Finch traveled to Akbar's Fatehpur Sikri, met him, and he returned to England. The ship in which uh, Ralph Finch was traveling was called the Tiger. It is about this tiger that they are referring to here as the master of the tiger. So Shakespeare was familiar with it, most probably being a voracious reader. It is probable that he had also read the letter of uh, Stevens. And he was certainly, he must have known Fitch uh, when he was living in England. But more important for us is this one, another ship. The name of the ship is called the Red Dragon. There are controversies regarding this. The Red Dragon, uh, this picture is drawn of the ship when it was docked, it docked at Malacca in 1602. But then this ship was captained by somebody called Captain Keeling, William Keeling. William Keeling was, in, uh, was sent by the East India Company to explore trade possibilities 
and to do trade with the Indies, the East Indies, not the West Indies, to the East Indies. He has made several trips. So, and most of them were done in this particular ship called the Red Dragon. And according to his diary, I mean, they, they, as you know, the, the captains of the ship maintain a journal. The journal of the ship, the, um, we got a fragment of the journal of the ship, and this is one, I mean, what I'm going to tell you is more reported in other books than from the surviving documents. The, a piece of the surviving document is this. So we know that there was a journal, and on 6, 5th of September 1607, when the ship was traveling to India, off the coast of the present day um, Africa, uh, around that time, uh, around that place when it was docked there, they said on 5th September 1607, they staged the tragedy of Hamlet on the ship. That was when Shakespeare was alive. Maybe this is, could be the first. staging of Shakespeare outside England. And again, on 30th September 1607, they played Richard II. And again, on 31st March 1608, they, he says, we again played um, Hamlet. Now, what is the importance about this? William Keeling, we know from his diaries, from his journals and other sources, he docked at Surat and he came and visited the Zamorin of Calicut. So he was in India as somebody who was staging Shakespeare, according to his journal, was already there in India when Shakespeare was alive. Now, this began to expand by 1608. The influence of England began to expand. And we, not, we know that you know, these red spots that you see there are the spread of English kingdom. So 1680, 1750, 1885, by the time India is almost under the sway of the British. And then by 1950, it is the height of the British Empire. This is the empire which they called the empire in which suns ne sun never sets. Now, then it began to decline. By 1945, just before the independence of India, it has come down from the previous one. And now, 59, and from 59, it looks like this, except for a small island in Falklands and some couple of islands in the uh, uh, in some oceans. Otherwise, England is limited. It has come back to Shakespeare's time. Our point is that our, our, what we are focusing is that how British came to India. By 1690s, they established a trading spot in Calcutta. And Calcutta had come under their control by 1690. By 1696, they built the up to 1702. They constructed a big fort there as the trading capital, Fort William. And 1772 to 1911, it was the capital of the British India, then of the capital of Bengal. And today, it's the capital of West Bengal. You can see from the picture, it was a very busy spot at that time. This was the city of Chaurangi, where uh, one of the theaters came up. In the 1700s, it looked like this, a perfect marriage of Indian and Western cultures, you can see there. Now, in Calcutta, they were trying to build Shakespeare theater. Even, actually, even from 1750s, when these people were living there, from the 1750s onwards, you see, from 1702, the construction of Fort William was over. By 1750s, there were a lot of Englishmen there, and therefore, their own entertainment used to stage many plays. And of course, they also staged Shakespeare. And now, when that, uh, when this was going on, at a point of time, they decided to bring players from England. Remember, the empire was flexing its muscles by that time. Now, they br began to bring players from England, and they wanted to build a proper theater in uh, Calcutta. And for that, 
they sought the help of this person called David Garrick. David Garrick was the biggest promoter of Shakespeare that we know. Without him, Shakespeare wouldn't have been the Shakespeare that we think he is today. It is a Shakespeare Jubilee of 1769 that promoted Shakespeare. In 1764, it should have been promoted, but then nobody was willing to take it up. So 1769, David Garrick, a famous Shakespeare actor, he came and promoted Shakespeare in a big way. And actually, in this scene, what you see here is there his singing, I mean, his recitation of the ode to Shakespeare, where the last line is this, it is he, it is he, the god of our idolatry. The god of our idolatry became the bard, and now we have the culture of bardolatry. Shakespeare was promoted by the English people like a poetic genius and a demigod at that time. And the important thing is this part, which I have, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to tell you. David Garrick was requested by the people living in England, sorry, in Calcutta, especially from the East India Company. They wrote to Garrick asking him to send them men and material to build a proper theater. And Garrick sent them a person called Bernard Messing to set up Calcutta Theatre. And it was set up there. And he gave books. He gave the uh, curtains. And he gave uh, the measurements and designs and everything. And then Gilbert Ironside writes back to Messing, uh, sorry, uh, Garrick, thanking him. And what is he thanking for? for implementing, for setting up the, uh, sending Messing to set up the Calcutta Theatre and for implementing the British civilization mission through Shakespeare's performances. So even before uh, our uh, people like um, uh, Macaulay and all that come up, even before that, we had this notion of the British civilizing mission. And they implemented it through Shakespeare and Shakespeare's language. In the theater, it was not the only theater that they had. There were several theaters which has come up in Calcutta. The first one, as I told you, which came in the 1950s was called the Playhouse or the old Fort Playhouse, distinguished from the Calcutta Theater, which uh, uh, Garrick helped to establish in 1774. And then there are several other theaters, Bristow, uh, Chaurangi, Sansosi, and so all these theatres promoted Shakespeare in a big way, because partly because of the British Empire. In an epistolary novel published in 1789, we have a description of the Calcutta Theatre built at that time. I don't want to go into that in detail because of the paucity of time. You can read that. He speaks about how gentlemen of England play. Shakespeare and how it became a location of their cultural um, superiority and importance. Similarly, in Bombay also, theaters came up. We find that especially the, um, we find the Bombay Amateur Theater, 1776, inviting foreign companies to stage Shakespeare there. There are several companies which came and played Shakespeare and especially the Elphinstone State Society was interested in promoting Shakespeare. They staged uh, the many plays of Shakespeare, like Merchant of Venice and so on. And because of the influence of this foreign companies which come and perform in India, and also because of uh, the King of Sangli, uh, who saw a performance elsewhere, and he wanted to create something like that in Britain, in, in, in for locally also. So he commissioned a person called Vishnudas Bhave to create a performance. And Bhave came up this performance of uh, Sida Swayambar. And this performance actually started what we call the Parsi theater in India. Then it was a flurry of theaters and flurry of uh, 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 companies, acting companies, local acting companies. And this acting company, as we know today, have become 
come into a bigger stage as what we call the Bollywood. It is actually these dramas produced by these Parsi theater, uh, which actually were, I mean, were really filmed to become uh, the early Indian films. Now let's come to the political part of it. When Shakespeare was being introduced around this time of the, when the theaters were coming up, we see two divergent tendencies, two faces of the British colonialism. One is William Jones, a patronizing Orientalist, and Thomas Barrington Macaulay, who is an imperialist. Remember, Macaulay was only 35 years old when he published the Minutes on Indian Education. And William Jones translated Chakuntala and Manusmriti, not Anusmriti, it is Manusmriti. Uh, and it, it is his translation of his works and his observation of uh, uh, the fact that um, there is a similarity between Sanskrit language and the Western languages like uh, Greek and Latin, which started the discipline called uh, linguistics or the modern discipline called linguistics. As you know, those who are studying Saussure will know. Saussure was, did his PhD in Sanskrit. And is this movement of uh, which encouraged Germans to discover Indians' intellectual you know, merit. And they went on trans, it's after this period that we find romanticism coming up. Well, that's another topic for another lecture. On the other hand, Macaulay was a straightforward, through and through imperialist who introduced the Minutes on Indian Education. The Minutes on Indian Education was introduced to say one thing very, very clearly. What we need in India is not the Oriental education, but the Western education. Oriental education was in Sanskrit or in Persian or in Urdu or in local languages. Macaulay said that is not the language that is required. We need English. And there are other reasons also, as we know, they wanted to create a class of men, British in character, Indian in color and so on. Uh, between, just look at the dates, that is important. Between the Orientalism of William Jones and the Minutes on Indian Education of Macaulay comes a very significant development. That is the fall of the Tipu Sultan. Uh, the, uh, uh, on 4th May, 1799, at the South Indian state of Karnataka. It's actually a battle with the Keralites that resulted in the death of Tipu Sultan. They got, I mean, a state of Travancore, along with the British army, went and uh, caught, caught, killed uh, Tipu Sultan. This defeat of Tipu Sultan, who was their biggest enemy, Tipu was actually corresponding with Napoleon at that time to defeat the British. This defeat of Tipu gave the British the confidence to establish what they call the Fort William College and change the nature of Indian education forever. Remember the date Tipu was killed was 4th May 1999. And exactly a year later, commemorating it, they passed a statute celebrating the anniversary of their victory over Tipu to found the Fort William College in 4th May 1800. It was actually a men, uh, it was meant as a training academy for the British officers who come to India. And the British officers who came to India were asked to learn a local language. Uh, they were picking up local languages, especially like Sanskrit, Persian, Bengali, Hindi, and Urdu. Remember, they were against Oriental education. They wanted to give English education, but they were training their people in Oriental languages. And our significant question here is, a person called Claude Moncton, who was posted in Bengal as a civil servant for British East India Company, he translated The Tempest, Shakespeare's last play, which appears first in the uh, first folio, into Bengali language in 1809. This was known as the first Shakespeare translation into any Indian language. And this is from the, their report 
and of 1809, the report of the Fort William College in 1809. They say that, you know, we know that Mr. Moncton has undertaken and has been able to execute a translation into Bengali of Shakespeare's tragedy, The Tempest. And they appreciate it in the minutes, saying that this was, we know that it was a difficult task, but then he was able to succeed in it. And soon after this, the Indians are also coming and responding to it by establishing the Hindu College Calcutta. In Hindu College Calcutta, we find this westernized institution coming up in India. Today, we call it the Presidency College. It was here that the English Anglo-Indian poet, Henry de Rosio taught. He died at a very young age, but he was an excellent speaker and a teacher, and he inspired a whole generation of people. And his students staged Shakespeare in other institutions, in the schools, in the Hindu theater, in the, the, the San Soci theater, and so on. This is Henry de Rosio, a very young man who had an untimely death, but the period he lived, remember, he, 1809 to 98, sorry, 1809 to 1831. So how old was he? During that time, he inspired a lot of people. And then next was the Sanskrit college. Sanskrit was being taught in the Western medium. I mean, the sense that in a Western medium of education was being used. And so many other institutions also come up during that time. Calcutta Medical College, University of Calcutta, uh, other, other institutions which come up. And Macaulay's Minutes of British edu English Education comes up in 1835. This was a clear case of the victory of British education over Oriental education. Oriental education was promoted by the people in uh, what, we, what we call the so see some lines coming up there. I think somebody is drawing lines. If you please stop it, that's better. Okay, thank you. Uh, the Oriental education versus British education was there. And by the time the minutes of education was published, it's actually the adaptation of the minutes and it became an act. And that's how we find the English education coming up in India. And uh, they, Intention was very clear. We must do our best to create a class of persons, Indians in blood and British in taste and opinions and in intellect. Well, it's a very clear cut colonial agenda that they had. And the next political event that happened was the fall of Delhi. First, I spoke to you about the fall of the Southern Empire by the, uh, by, by the, uh, of Tipu Sultan. Then the resisting empire was the, the, the Marathas where they were not permitting the Oriental education, the Western education, they preferred Oriental education with the elephant stone uh, and so on. And now in 1857, with the fall of Delhi, they became an unassailable power. In 1857 itself, they established the universities. Calcutta, Bombay and Madras, they established universities and Shakespeare became a part of Indian education. 1857. It was these natives who were educated in these Western institutions in India who translated Shakespeare more into Indian languages. And they also acted as gatekeepers to the Shakespeare translation of India into Indian languages. Uh, you can see the picture, the difference in the picture. When uh, Thomas Rowe came to Jahangir's court, he was a supplicant. And then uh, after the fall of 1857, English became the masters. Now let's see how Shakespeare brought to India in this way. We managed to look at Shakespeare and we tried to create a Shakespeare of our own. Over a period of time, we changed him. In the initial phase, what we find is we find a Western Shakespeare produced as such. But that was not highly appreciated by the Indian. It is always the localized Shakespeare that is appreciated by the Indians. Bharata's Natishastra significantly 
as we know, uh, influence Indian culture or Indian performance. Plays like Pia Bahrupia is a wonderful adaptation of the Twelfth Night. Excuse me, sir. It came as a piece of yes. Yes, somebody was speaking. Sir, uh, actually, I want to yes, sir. Actually, I want to inform the participants. Will request uh, to the participants, please do not overwrite on the screen. It is disturbing the speaker. I humbly request the participant, please uh, not to write or scribble anything on the screen. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, in Pia Bahrupia, what we find is this. Now, it's a totally localized adaptation in the Nautangi style. Absolutely Indianizing. You cannot find that this character, these people here, it's a Shakespeare play. But this is one of the best adaptations of Shakespeare ever of the Twelfth Night. It was staged in uh, the Globe Theater and won a great it was, it was It was greatly praised. And look at this. Another performance by our uh, Habib Tanbir. I just play a script. A smaller clip from that. Please listen to that. Look and see how Habib Tanvir Indianizes the Amr Samhain ice cream. Uh, you can uh, get this down, uh, download in the YouTube. It's a pretty go good uh, play. Actually, one of the best plays that is produced in India. Abhit Tanvir, as you know, is a London-trained theatre person. And he came back and absolutely Indianized Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream into the Chhattisgarhi culture. And he used their language. And this was one of the most successful Indian productions on theatre. And uh, and we have even takes upon takes on Pierre Behubia Kim, and then we have another film on that, Pierre Gay Rangoon. And look at the color of India. Shakespeare was introduced in different ways. This is Shakespeare's uh, in, in Kathagali format. Uh, because I am from Kerala, I would like to introduce you to that. This is uh, Kathagali. Uh, King um, Antony and Cleopatra, Kathakali, King Lear, and several formats are used to adapt Shakespeare's plays into Indian languages. And the Kathakali King Lear was staged in the Globe Theatre, and I will show you a clip of that. Now, I'm sure that you know, many people won't understand the language of this theater because it's a highly sophisticated and technical theater. With each of the mudras having its own meanings and the, the dress and the color, the makeup, everything has its own semiotic significance. And this person, Sadhanam Balakrishnan, highly uh, produced Kathakali Otherlo and it was a highly acclaimed production in India and also abroad. And B.V. Karan produced uh, Macbeth as Burnham Vanna, 
It was in 1950s that he produced it. And even now the same play is being staged. But this was used in another theater format of South India. It's called Yakshagana. They used the motives of Yakshagana and he fused it into the, 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 the Indian, Indian aesthetics and then he produced this play. And he fused Western aesthetics with Eastern aesthetics to produce this play. And then this, pro, you know, when she, the pure Shakespeare was still continuing in India. For example, this is a Shakespearean troupe led by uh, Kendall family. Gregory, Gregory Kendall and his Anglo-Indian troupe. It was actually the pure Shakespeare. They wanted to produce an unadulterated Shakespeare in the proper English character. And it was a highly successful production before the independence of India. Once the British had left India, the way we appreciated Shakespeare in India changed significantly. By 56, it came down. But then there is something important about this. These two actors, as we know, Utpal Dutt and Shashi Kapoor, they were also part of this troupe called Shakespearean. Utpal Dutt, uh, Shashi Kapoor went on to become a major Hollywood actor in commercial movies. Utpal Dutt was even a greater figure. Here you can find Utpal Dutt along with this Shakespearean troupe. And he produced this famous localization of Shakespeare. This is not Utpadal's picture, this is another picture. But then it's called, using the, uh, the Bengali theater called Jatra, he produced Jatra Shakespeare and popularized Shakespeare in the local format in, 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 in Bengal. Actually, even as a student, Utpadal excelled in staging Shakespeare in pure English. And that is how he got interested in Shakespearean. He went on around the country playing Shakespeare in English. And then after severing ties with them, he started a theater called the Little Theater, again staging Shakespeare. But then in his autobiography, he says, or sorry, in the interview, he says, see, at the, in the life of, the, of, of, of an actor, there are certain moments. Uh, I found that when I staged Shakespeare in English, everybody was wrapped in attention listening to me intently, but they were not responding to it. Indians were not responding to Shakespeare. But the moment I took Shakespeare into the local theater, Jatra theater, Shakespeare became something else. He went around, in one season, he played nine, staged 98 performances of his Jatra Macbeth. It was a hugely successful production, and he redefined the way we looked at Shakespeare. From 1950s, he went on playing uh, the, the, the Jatra Macbeth. Uh, Shakespeare is increasingly adapted in other formats also. For example, here you find uh, people are experimenting with that. In, uh, in, in, uh, in, in theater formats, we find them, uh, sorry, in dance formats, we, we can see them playing Shakespeare. This is by a performance by one Ms. Kalingal who produced uh, Shakespeare in the Ashta Naiga format. Here is a performance of, the, of Juliet. Remember, the language is English, but the performance is Indian. Using the mudras, steps, which is typically Indian, we are trying to promote or project a kind of Shakespeare. So Shakespeare today, lives in India in a different way. He tries to, if you can look at the slide by the side of it, you can see that how different types of Nayagas mentioned in, um, in um, Bharatanatyam are used, uh, 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 she is trying to exp express these characters using Shakespeare's heroines like Cleopatra, Portia, Ophelia, Macbeth, and so on. Now, what happened? What is the change that was happened? The British induced a change in Indian theater. By Shakespeare productions, especially, 
and the British productions, the Western productions, induced a major change in Indian languages. The Indian performances came within the what we call the proscenium stage. India never performed on the proscenium stage. Indian performance, I will show you in the following slides. Indian performance are different. It is very difficult to capture Indian performances within the structure of the proscenium stage. But then proscenium stage is what we are familiar with today. So we try to accommodate Western proclivities and the Indian theaters. Uh, Indian theaters were, tried, were, were accommodated within our Western uh, proclivities. And today we have a, a different kind of a theater. Here is uh, Shagundala being performed by a Parsi theater. Parsi theater, as you know, is a marriage between the Western and the Eastern formats. Look at the Indian theater. This is a performance of Tayyam in the place I am from. This is a, every, every year, this happens in front of the temples here or the cows or the sacred groves here in Kasargod. They, these actors, I mean, they become demigods at a certain point of time. And they walk through the fire. This performance has to be done in the open air. This cannot be done within the, 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 the confines of a, a, a proscenium theater. The nature is the theater in India. We have a different sensibility, different kind of approach that we have. And if you think, how can you have proscenium theater here? This is something which people of, I mean, they, during the, this is another theme called Khandagarna theme. And this is about 22, 23 feet high. The man carries it on his head. Not one, many people carry it on their head and they walk without losing balance for, for a long time. And using this performance codes of the theme, we have uh, what we call um, the um, Shakespeare was adapted using the format of this particular theater. I'm sure you must have come across a theater called uh, the, um, sorry, a film called uh, Kaliyat. Sorry, this is an ad. Okay, let them finish their ad. I will go through this. So in, 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 in there's a film a director called Jairaj in Kerala who adapted Shakespeare's Othello into this particular theater format. Using the story of this particular uh, theater artist, he tried to tell you the story of Shakespeare's Othello. And there, I don't know what something went wrong. I'll show you the final clip of that. With the famous scene of the killing of, uh, where, where uh, he, try, he murders, Othello murders um, Desdemona. Then he realizes that, you know, uh, the mistake. And then this Tayyam performer, who is acting as uh, Othello in this particular scene, in this particular adaptation, he runs into the fire, animates himself. And when you see action, when you see this in the movie, it's a very heart-wrenching scene, a brilliant adaptation of how or the lowest performed.
me see whether I can uh, go back and get it. Okay, let's come back. I hope you can hear me. Now, what I mean to say is that this kind of a theater where Indian sensibility is used, it cannot be accommodated within the proscenium theater. Now, Parsi theater, as I told you, it tried to synthesize the Western theater by taking Shakespeare and the Indian theater. And it is most, is well known for its formula. For example, dance, fights, songs, exactly the same that we find in the Bollywood today. This is again, this is a, one of the performance of Othello in Parsi theater. You can see it's confined within the proscenium theater. These are some of the old photographs which are available in um, um, Puram Trivedi's book. These are some of the major people who adapted, tried to adapt Shakespeare for the Parsi theater. Aga Hashir Kashmiri, he tried, adapted Shakespeare, uh, different plays of Shakespeare. The Winter's Tale, The Measure of a Measure, King Lear, uh, King and John and Richard II together, and Macbeth. And he was, in, he was even called the Indian Shakespeare. Then we have uh, uh, Sayyid Hassan Laknavi. Hassan, Lak uh, Hassan Laknavi, is, that is the name it is called. Also translated many plays of Shakespeare for the Parsi theater. And uh, in Gujarat theater, which is not very far away from the Parsi theater, they, you know, they produce many plays of Shakespeare. And some of the actors who played in Shakespeare, especially this actor called um, Bapulal Nayak, he came to be known as the Saubhagya Sundari because he was, uh, uh, this is a scene of Othello, as you can see here. And this man was known as by his, uh, the name of the character in this play, Sundari, throughout his life. Another one was Vidya, Vidya, Vidya Dhar Gokhale's Madanachi Manjari, which was also made into a film later. But it continues even today. Look at your, uh, you know, the uh, display. Um, Ram Leela. It's a version of uh, our, our um, Romeo and Juliet. The Shakespeare never goes out of hand. We reinvent Shakespeare. Even from the days of the silent films, Bollywood was using Shakespeare. There are nine silent films. Unfortunately, none of them survive today. That's the problem. None of them survive because of a fire in the National Film Archives. We know that these films were uh, made. Uh, the first earliest known film of Shakespeare was an adaptation of Cymbeline I, as Chambra Jihado in 1923. And then uh, this film, Sohra Modi's Kun Ka Kun, or an adaptation of Hamlet, is the famous scene where Hamlet is in the pensive mood of to be or not to be. It was both in the theater and it was also adapted on the stage. And this film was the first film in the world to adapt Shakespeare, uh, Shakespeare's Macbeth, sorry, Hamlet as a talkie, as a talking film. Not a movie, as a talkie. This is the first film in the world. So we have some first to our credit Indians have done wonderfully in Shakespeare. When they, in, when, when they published Shakespeare in, in the world, in, 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 in the, even in the 90, 1990s, they hardly accounted for five films in India. But actually, Puram Trivedi recently came out with a list of 147. We are yet to discover our Shakespeare. These are some of the scenes. Even this film is destroyed. These are some of the photographs that remain. And this is one of the scenes in which uh, our Ophelia is co committing suicide or getting mad. So it was a wonderful production, there is no doubt. On the other hand, this was the uh, production of King John. This seems to be the first 
ever Shakespeare film, not in India, in the world. This is something that you can find on the internet. They recently, they, it was thought that this was lost and from the British uh, Royal Archives, they found out this film and now it's available for the public. This is the last scene where uh, King John dies. You can uh, find out it from the net. I don't want to continue this. Just for your information, this is the first scene of Shakespeare. I mean, first scene. Uh, now here, how fast can you perform a Shakespeare? Those who have not seen Romeo and Juliet, uh, this is a very interesting take on jo Romeo and Juliet. It finishes the whole play in one minute. And this is an advertisement of a, um, you can count your time, go by the watch. Just see how fast Romeo and Juliet finishes. That was an ad for Nextel, a kind of a, a, a telephone service. So Shakespeare can be adapted in different ways. He's adapted in different uh, modes. For example, sometimes you know you find ads based on Shakespeare in Hindi. Amul comes out with many ads. One, one which I come across I came across was a, a crowd, crowdside Ro, Romeo instead of roadside Romeo, crowdside Romeo. And this is. Another movie, which uh, I mean, actually, this is the only movie of comedy of errors worth uh, citing. There are also earlier ones in Bengali, but then this production by Gulzar, Angur of 1982. You can see, you, you can type this, and uh, this is one of the brilliant adaptations of Shakespeare. You can see this movie on, 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 on your YouTube. I don't want to waste my time on that. Where this is a story of two brothers coming together. I mean, separated uh, twins. A pair of twins. Uh, one is played by Sanjeev Kumar. The other is played by another Bengali actor. And these two people, there's a double. They find them in an island where they're getting trapped. Exactly the same story of Romeo of Syracuse and Romeo of and and and, and the, this, the same story is repeated here. But then it's a brilliant adaptation within Indian context, and it is not even one second of this movie is a boring one. Such brilliant adaptations have been produced in India, and it's very difficult to reproduce such a movie in any in any language. Now what are the translations since Moncton and what is mean by translations? As we know, there are translations, adaptations and so on. And so we, recently we said translation adaptations, not adaptation. Uh, Durla Bandhu is uh, uh, one of the early translations of Shakespeare, even though this is not the first translation. We'll come to that list later. In this Let's see how Indians localized Shakespeare. Better than me, Professor Harish Srivedi will be able to say that. I'll play a clip which I have shot. I mean, it is, I produced this clip. So I can tell you how uh, Harish Srivedi plays this. Uh, Harish Srivedi explains one from uh, a translation of Shakespeare. I'll just play this clip for you. This is a video that I produced for the MOOC. Okay, let's see here.
Okay, Harish Trivedi in his characteristic way, you know, describes uh, the uh, how Shakespeare is portrayed in Hindi. And similarly, in other languages also across India, we have localized Shakespeare. Over the course of time, we find this is a kind of localization as a form of resistance in dealing with Shakespeare. Uh, similarly, with, we also find with Harivam Shrai Bachchan's translation of, you know, the famous Madhushala is there. And it's in the, in the, in the, 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 and he refers to Arvindu's translation. And remember, I mean, uh, Arvindu's translation is a, uh, returned with a, with a degree from um, England. And he was one of the finest scholars and also a great poet. Similarly, in other places of India also, we find translations of Shakespeare. Uh, this person called Pamal Samanda Mudaliyar. Uh, okay, um, dominated the uh, the South Indian theater for a very long time. He translated at least five plays of Shakespeare. And all these plays of Shakespeare, these are localizations, not just adaptations. In Malayalam, we find the first play coming as early as 1866. And there are two complete translations of Shakespeare's works into Malayalam. One as more of us in the form of a novel or a story. And the other one as pure translation, pure technical translations. Both are edited by this professor of English, Professor Ayya Papanikar. The last one was in 2000. And these are the earliest translations of Shakespeare's plays in India. Um, listing the chronologically, the first one was in 1848, but then this is not available. We only come to hear about it. 1852, Taming of the Shrew, as Nathare Ferengi taken his Avi. And then 1853 translation is available, Bhanumadi Chitta Bilash is available, and many of the other translations are available. But then many of these are not exactly the complete translations of Shakespeare, rather, most of them were abridged ones or translations of stories. For example, the Kashinath Katri's translate, Hindi translations, all of which come in 1880s, are mostly uh, translation of stories and not of the story, not of the complete books. And so is this, uh, the works by Ganga Prasad, although all of them come in 18, 1914. These are the earliest translations of Shakespeare that we know. We've already seen brilliant uh, adaptations of movies uh, Shakespeare into movies. We uh, we saw a clip from uh, Kalyatam, and I'm sure you people are very familiar with Omkara, uh, Jay Raja's trilogy of Kal Kal Kalyatam, Kannagi, and Viram. These are three uh, uh, movie adaptations of his, and uh, Vishal Bharadwaj's three movie adaptations on a bigger scale, Omkara, Makbul, and Haider, which adapts Othello, Macbeth, and Hamlet. In three and actually, these movies are now being rated as one of the best productions of Shakespeare ever by anybody in the world. So I'm trying to, since time is up, I'm trying to wind up. Uh, some of the helpful books for you, I will suggest these books. Those who are interested in the topic can go through these books to understand more about this topic. Uh, this is uh, one professor from Delhi Universities, Indra Prasta College, Professor Poonam Trivedi. There's the wife of the other Professor Trivedi that we saw, Harish Trivedi, but she's a specialist in Shakespeare studies, especially Shakespeare in India. These are the, her books published by, mostly by Rutledge. Shakespeare's Asian Journeys, Shakespeare and Indian Cinema. This came in 2020. And uh, Shakespeare Replaying in Asia and India's Shakespeare. These are some of the finest productions of Shakespeare in India. And then these are some of the other play, uh, other works that we come across. Shakespeare in Indian languages, Shakespeare and Indian theater, Bollywood Shakespeare's, and Masala Shakespeare. These are some of the works which you can consult. I hope this lecture has been useful for you somehow. So thank you very much. Thank you. Now over to you. Um, now the participants can uh, post their doubts in the chat box. Sir, kindly uh, check your chat box, sir, for the questions. Yes, I can see many. You can select any questions, sir. 
is something that is localized there are many things which is missing of course what is important is how the play is presented in a local context there are many things you know missing of course right from the names some of the names are significant and from the names onwards they are missing you are better judges when you watch a hindi movie you are you must be better judges let's not get into answers here let's more look you know this is a more kind of an exchange of ideas Kalidas is called Shakespeare of India, while Kalidas was born hundred years, thousand years before Shakespeare. Wouldn't of course, this is a usual question. There, see, had we been ruling British Britain, certainly we would have called Shakespeare a Kalidas of England. Unfortunately, we didn't rule them. Maybe there will be a time when we will be ruling them, or we will be ruling the world, and then we can certainly call uh, Shakespeare the Kalidas of India. It's our entitled. We are entitled to do that. Uh, more reliable documents of shakespeare's life is available so can we tell shakespeare's a myth or a group of writers uh, this is a shakespeare you know conspiracy theory that we know there are several ox theories which says shakespeare was not shakespeare or the plays were written not by this man who was uneducated but more records show that it was this shakespeare who actually wrote shakespeare if you were more interested in the topic there is a um uh, what the name of the uh, I'll, I'll tell you when it comes to me in mind uh recently a scholar came out with a uh, what's his name james shapiro has come out with a uh, shapiro has come out with a documentary on uh, about, about this particular controversy about whether shakespeare was actually shakespeare we these are more but the brilliant research that goes into showing that shakespeare is not actually shakespeare is worth especially the the site called the, the there's one which says that edward de vere was, was the one who actually wrote shakespeare that particular site is very useful because the academic rigor that goes into it what we look there is really you know is a hypothesis somebody is trying to prove a hypothesis that's all it is not that you know it need not, need not be generally true uh do you think students from india should be taught adapted texts and primary texts uh now here i i actually missed one of them uh see <laughs> shakespeare was introduced in india i told you that around 1800s in 1809 what we find is the two adaptations of shakespeare was published were published in english one was the lamb's tales from shakespeare second was family shakespeare by the bowdlers bowdler siblings and the lamb siblings brought both of them brought out two different versions of shakespeare these were made because they wanted to make it more communicative even to the english speaking people today i'm sure one of the greatest difficulty for you people when you look at shakespeare is his language of course language is an archaic language so should we put him in the modern language and study that is one question second can we make it more simple more communicative today but then that won't be shakespeare if uh, it's just like asking you know how much importance are you giving to a text is more important for example you won't like your sacred text to be written in ordinary language in the same way any scholarly text that you approach i don't want to say shakespeare text you Shakespeare's text is a scholarly text. That is not what I want to say. What I want to say is only this: uh, the um, when, whatever text you select, the text as such doesn't become important except from a very academic sense of it. So to cut it down in a different shape, well, that depends on the purpose for which you are you are using it for. when we speak about translation we say who is your customer is more important for which deva are you doing the puja for kasmai deva is a important question in when you do puja or yaga to which deva are you doing this work for to which audience are you doing this for 
Uh, do you think students of India should be taught the adapted text as primary? No, I, I, it all depends. You know, maybe at a undergraduate level or a college level, sorry, the, the high school level, I don't think there's any point in teaching the original Shakespeare. But at a PG level, for example, well, we have to go through the original Shakespeare because you are, we are trying to master that language. Don't you think that the successful adaptations of Shakespeare's plays owes more to the genius of the people who adapted it by changing the context, yet by retaining the essence? Of course, yes. Translation is not a secondary business. Translation is a primary business. The, uh, uh, the, the, some people have even praised their translators and even said that, you know, when it is a translator who made my work actually better. So, if any day, Vishal Bharadwaj is as good as Shakespeare. Just because Shakespeare was living at a point of time somewhere in the past, let's not make a great thing out of Shakespeare. Shakespeare is great, there is no doubt. Shakespeare is a great person, a genius in his particular selected field. But there are other genius people all over the world. Let's not undermine them. Uh, he was, actually, he was not a poet at the starting only. After the black lady deceived him and his life changed. <laughs> this is a, one of the hypotheses that we have about Shakespeare's life. Uh, we do not know. The, fact, the very fact is that we do not know much about Shakespeare. Yeah, okay. But more things are coming into light. So thank you very much. Uh, I think I've addressed most of the important questions there. If, I'm sorry if I missed somebody. Uh, so sir, thank you very much. Anything else? Your audio is not, uh, your, uh, yes, Binti, yeah, right now, yes. Yes. Uh, Any other questions, anybody? Uh, I hope that uh, the audience, uh, the participants. Uh, no, there is a question left. Okay. Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Yes, please. Go ahead. Thank you, sir. So uh, the question is, this is from one, two, three, four, five. Do you think Omkara, a Hindi movie, is a good adaptation of Othello and Heather, again a Hindi movie, of Hamlet? Please highlight the points which are missing in the adaptation. There are many points which are missing. There are many points which are missing, but these are brilliant adaptations. Let's go by that. See, a person, when he adapts, will not be able to pick and choose Sorry, we will not be able to be faithful to every single element. That's that's exactly why he is adapting it. So there is no point in saying that this particular line is missing or this particular line is missing. What is more important is that has he been able to give you deliver a proper experience of Hamlet? When you see Hyder, well, Hyder was he was never in Kashmir. He was never using guns. So all these things are there very much. And uh, certainly he was not fighting, you uh, know, Omi was not, so, oh, unlike Omi, Othello was not entering into any brawls here in, uh, in, in, in Hamlet, uh, sorry, in Othello. So there are differences. But then it is a brilliant way of, it, it, in, in the local culture, when you express, when, in, uh, when you put, when you express something in a local culture, for a local audience, you have to, speak to them in their language and not in somebody else's language. If you speak in somebody else's language, well, you will be talking in Greek or Latin. Now, let, the success, I mean, there is no doubt Vishal Bharadwaj's trilogies are world acclaimed. There is no doubt about it. And now, for your information, you know, till now, uh, in the 2020 or 20 or 21, the Oxford Handbook of Shakespeare is going to be published. Every I minute, mean, they, they revise it every 10 years. And the 2020 edition, no less person than uh, Akira Kurosawa is going to be replaced by Vishal Bharadwaj. Akira Kurosawa's um, adaptations of Shakespeare are very famous and these are said to be the standard ones. And now in the 2021 edition, Kurosawa is going to be replaced by Vishal Bharadwaj. So the, Let's be proud of our our writers or our 
brilliant adapters. So, as I told you, the, the, the first talkie of Shakespeare comes from, of Hamlet comes from India. And the, the best adaptation, there are very few adaptations. The best adaptation of uh, any Shakespeare play, if you take the best adaptation, Angur will be there right at the top. I mean, such a brilliant adaptation has never been made. But remember, it is a comedy. Tragedy is easy to make. But comedy is extremely difficult to replicate in the modern circumstances because it plays on language. It plays on language of Shakespeare's time. To replicate that in today's context, comedy is extremely difficult business. But then look at this. I mean, those, those people who are, who are watching this, please go and watch. I mean, uh, today itself, you watch Angur. It's a, one of the best adapted. You, you will not find Shakespeare boring after seeing this particular play. Okay, there are other questions coming up. Yes. How much do, time do I have? No, sir, you can explain, please. Okay. Do you agree with the view that, do you agree with, this is Sanjay Kumar. Huh. Do you agree with this view that Shakespeare did not have the first-hand experience at the lower middle class because his characters belong to royal families? No, Shakespeare belonged to royal middle class. Sorry, he belonged to the middle class. He actually had a, his life, he had a very big struggle. <coughs> But then during Shakespeare's time, let's be alive to this possibility. Stories were told only about the stories of kings, not the ordinary people. That revolution came much later. Uh, you, you don't find beggars opera, for example. These are much later productions. Uh, even in our, our cases, for example, we, I mean, this is one of the Features of the feudal societies. Stories are told about the kings or about very noble, rich, or saintly people, and not about the ordinary life. Ordinary life actually became important only when women started writing novels, as we know. When women started writing novels, they gave expression, they gave validity to their personal experience, and their personal experience became valid in the public sphere. Till then, and that is the basic difference between these grand narratives and the personalized narratives. Uh, so there are two more questions. Uh, okay. and, and I assure you, this will be the last two more okay. questions. One by Chen, the guy is working on Shakespearean adaptations. And uh, the question is, uh, uh, so, uh, this is by Chen, the Will you please highlight, is that one? Will you please highlight the significance of the song from right. the Vira by Jairaj, where the column is first drawn and then erased. Uh, this is more at the local, you know, using the local myths and so on. I'm sure this is every, I don't want to go into the specific of that, because every story has, I mean, every act in a, in a local society has got some kind of a significance. Every totem, or a, when we, in, in Thiam, we, what we, call, we say is a totem. Uh, the, 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 the figures that I showed you earlier, the, the Thiam performances, each of the Thiam has a song attached with that. And that song will tell you the story of that particular Thiam. I and mean, when these are brilliantly used within the story, within the narratives, uh, I mean, I, um, personally speaking, Viram, as far as I am concerned, was the most, was the least, is the least favorite of mine in Malayalam adaptations com com compared to other other movies. Uh, so the Going and erasing, well, these are all cinematic languages, or semiotic languages. Yes, okay. any other question? Do you think there would be a good idea to teach Shakespeare along with adaptations in which the medium is to expand our knowledge of the culture of the exchange? It all depends on your purpose. It all depends on your purpose. What is that you want to teach? If you want to teach language, well, there is one kind of Shakespeare. If you want to understand the history, historical evolution of English language, well, Shakespeare in the original becomes important. If you want to make, create a discourse of the feudal structure in which Shakespeare operated, well, the story is more important. And some of the linguistic expressions becomes important. But it all depends on your purpose. 
what is it that makes Shakespeare Shakespeare? Is it the story that made Shakespeare or his way of telling that made Shakespeare or his language made Shakespeare? So we have to judge what is Shakespeare? These are not very simple uh, yes or no kind of answers that we, uh, but that is not, I mean, uh, see, as you know, at the level of the school, we will be able to get give an answer, yes or no. I'm sure you are very confident when you passed out of your school, you know everything. But the higher you learn, you understand the limits of your knowledge. And by the time you get a PhD and start teaching that you will understand that you don't know anything. At that time, you know, you become humbled by, you know, the, your knowledge, for example. When you say, some, I would like to learn something from you, for example, when I'm looking at other things, you know, we, at every point of time we are studying and at each point of time our observations become different we get newer perspectives and so on so that's not going to categorical answers at the level of higher studies that is a very simplistic answer yes or no black and white but we know between black and white there are so many other colors it all depends on which color you are using or which color you are focusing on So uh, this was the last question, I think, uh, Bensi, ma'am. Can you suggest the point on Shakespeare? The points on Shakespeare because I am inspired by the great personality and want to write a romantic play. How Shakespeare imagines such greatness? Well, that's a mystery. Some uh, people are born great. Shakespeare was somebody who was born great, and the secret of uh, making a good film, secret of making a great story, well, first is your feeling. As, I mean, this is again now all about, you know, the secret of literature. Um, as Shakespeare, I mean, as uh, Wordsworth has beautifully put in his poem, Daffodils, uh, or his definition of poetry. He says, you know, uh, it, uh, an emotion recollected in tranquility. You feel an emotion and you recollect that in tranquility. The moment you feel an emotion is not the moment when you create a story. You create a story in tranquility when you are in a distance. Your emotional outburst is not literature. So, the, 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 in, the, in the poem Daffodils, he says, you know, over a veil of uh, that cloud was traveling and it slowed down. It sees a host of golden daffodils. And then at the end of it, he says, the last paragraph, if you go, for oft when in my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood. They flash upon my inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. Then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. It that distance is important, and that you know, in a, in a, in a, that's one way of putting in Shakespeare's words. If you put in Indian words, well, Shravana Manana Nididhyasana. You hear it, you understand it, and then there's a third stage, Nididhyasana. You sit over it, meditate over it, and then you start speaking. That's how great scholars actually produce our great works. And then there's a touch of genius. Some people like Kalidasa, for example, uh, Devi blessed him just like that. And then he became a poet overnight. And that's at least that's the myth, the story goes. There are some people born poets. We, most of us, we struggle. I hope the person who asked the question, Ayush, is a born poet that you have experience, observe, and then not the minute. All literature is about the fine art of detailing, as you know. In the novel, what people generally miss, when students of literature generally miss, is uh, the story everybody knows. But then how the story was communicated, the fine art of words, the arrangement of words, that is what is more important. So our task is to make the writing the crafting of words, how to put that in that particular sequence. Again, the cinematic language, which scene comes first, which scene comes next, and how to make it, you know, make those scenes join together. What the sound that you use, that is the secret of writing. It's a craft, but also it's something that is perfected over a period of time. This is, uh, there's a separate discipline called creative writing. I hope I shall benefit from that. So, yes. That was the last question. Um, 
I believe that no duty is more urgent than of returning thanks. I thank you, sir, for the brilliant insights uh, uh, that you've unfurled the evident connections between British India and uh, uh, Shakespeare and India, in particularly. It was interesting and surprising to know that the Bollywood has its uh, connection to this uh, to Shakespeare, and how the establishments of universities act as a gateways, and. Um, uh, we uh, could know that Shakespeare, Shakespeare was also introduced and invented in different movies, uh, ads, uh, and various dance forms. Thank you so much, sir, for the diligent assimilation and the delivery of the topic. We had a really a great learning experience. Thank you so much, it sir. On, the, on, behalf of, much. on behalf of St. Joseph's College for Women, I once again extend my hearty thanks to sir. Thank you. Uh, a special a special thanks to Dr. Hari Pitripati for wonderful coordination of the literary event and Ajit sir for the technical assistance. I thank all the participants uh, who have joined us today. Thank you all once again. Have a nice day. Thank you. So thank you.